Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Yam. I work at NAFAC Exwick in Port Wainimi, California, and I would like to thank you for attending the Open Environmental Restoration Resource Webinar on Optimization Case Studies. Our speakers today are Joseph Rail from NAFAC Washington, Jocelyn Tomashiro from NAFAC Hawaii, and Christine Gaines from NAFAC Southwest. Joe will present long-term monitoring optimization at landfill sites. Jocelyn will talk about optimization recommendations through a treatability study at Onizuka Village. And Christine will share an optimization evaluation on a free product recovery system in Naval Air Weapon Station, China Lake. At the end of the presentation, we will be having a Q&A session. Participation on the webinar is voluntary and we highly recommend that you submit your question through the presentation, uh, throughout the presentation via our live Q&A chat box. If you have any technical issues, please reach out to Amy Hawkins or submit your uh, issue through the Q&A. This presentation will be recorded and the PowerPoint presentation and recording will be posted onto our public website. Following the webinar, a link will be available to a short survey. Please fill out the survey as it is our main feedback me mechanism and should take less than two minutes to complete. I want to emphasize the following important disclaimer. This webinar is intended to be informational and does not indicate endorsement of a particular product or technology by the D Department of Defense or by NAFAC Exwick. Although every attempt is made to provide the most accurate information, there is no guarantee that any technology or product will be suitable for your site. Before our speakers begin the presentation, I would like to invite Nate DeLong from NAFAC headquarters to say a few words about the OER2 webinars. Thank you, Michelle. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Nathan DeLong, and I am an Environmental Restoration Program Manager with NAFAC headquarters. We at NAFAC appreciate your participation in the Open Environmental Restoration OER2 webinar series. Since the start of the OER2 in 2014, We've hosted 28 webinars and we continue to provide them on a quarterly basis. We are excited to see the enthusiasm and feedback received from the ER community so far. This webinar series is for RPM, RTMs, contractors, and others who support the Department of Navy Environmental Restoration Program. Our goal is that the series will provide a venue for two-way communication, both reaching out to and obtaining feedback from the community members. The emphasis of the webinar series are open sharing information and promoting innovations among the community members. These can be policy-based guidance uh, technologies and lessons learned. Feedback from community members is key to the sustained success of the series, and we are always looking to community members to actively recommend topics and volunteer as presenters. Each topic should be relevant to the ERP uh, and should not contain marketing materials. The community member will present the topic with the support of the champion and presentation development team. As Michelle mentioned, today's webinar is on optimization case studies and we'll discuss strategies and lessons learned on how to implement optimization throughout the environmental restoration process. Optimization is an important part of the remediation approach to ensure efficiency and effectiveness at each site. Initially, you will hear from Joe Rail. Uh, who will share his experiences in implementing optimization during long-term management, and then from remedial technical managers Jocelyn Tomashiro and Christine Gaines on optimization strategies for treatability studies and free product recovery. With that, I'll hand it over to Joe and he can get the webinar started. Hey, thanks, Nate. So I'm going to talk about um, optimization at three landfill sites located at Naval Support Facility Indian Head, and they include sites 11, 21, and 36. So now I'm, I'm showing a figure here where you can see in the top left the uh, Washington, D.C. area. Um, 
Indian Head is located about 25 miles southwest of Washington, D.C. Uh, the facility of Indian Head is located along the Potomac River. So optimization efforts have been done at sites 11, 21, 36. There were three closed landfills that were sampled semi-annually for VOCs, total and dissolved metals, and then general chemistry, as was required by the state of Maryland, Maryland Department of Environment. The uh, remedies for these landfills were all similar. Uh, site 11 and 21 had protective soil covers that were installed along with institution controls and then a groundwater monitoring program. Site 36 is a little bit different in that we just used an existing soil and vegetative cover and again had the long-term monitoring for shallow groundwater at that site. And all of these sites have been monitored for about nine or 10 years now. So some of the optimization we were recommending or looking for, we wanted to reduce VOC sampling frequencies to once every five years so that we would have that data to include in each five-year review report. We also wanted to reduce metal sampling frequency from semi-annual to biannually. Same thing for site 36. Uh, we wanted to reduce VOC sampling frequency from semi-annual to biannual, and then the metal sampling frequency from semi-annual to annual. So site 11, Caffey Road Landfill. Uh, this is one where we had seven monitoring wells and no groundwater COCs per the rod, which was finalized in 2009. You can see a figure of the site there. This is a site that lies along the Madam Creek. Uh, to date, over 18 rounds of sampling have been completed, and some of the data has shown that there's been minimal VOC detections. Um, most of the detections were earlier in the sampling program. We had no MCL exceedances in any round, and for metals, Total and dissolved iron and manganese were an issue that have exceeded screening criteria for most of the rounds. We've also seen some other metals such as arsenic, barium, and cobalt, and lead. And we've seen that total and dissolved analyses have typically closely matched, and I included a figure to demonstrate that. So in this figure, you can see total on the top and then dissolved in the bottom, and you can see how the concentrations are just bouncing up and down, no indic indicative trends of increasing or decreasing. So our proposed optimization for this site was to reduce the VOC sampling frequency, as I said, to once every five years, go to biennial for the metals, and then reduce the metals list that we had down to six metals rather than the 22. We also wanted to eliminate the dissolved metals. Site 21 Bronze Road Landfill is similar with eight monitoring wells being sampled semi-annually. And the groundwater COC for this site was manganese. So again, over 18 rounds of sampling were completed for this site. Uh, we saw no MCL exceedances, low level VOC detections, and mostly non-detect for VOCs since 2015. The one exceedance that we do consistently see is iron and manganese, and then an occasional exceedance with cobalt. So in these figures, we want to again display that total and dissolved concentrations typically closely match, and they're up and down, no trends indicated for increasing or decreasing. So the proposed optimization is again, reduce the VOC sampling frequency to once every five years. Um, eliminate the VOC analyses for a couple of the wells in Montreal 4 and 5, reduce the metals sampling frequency from semi-annual to biennial, and then again reduce the metals list down to three analyzes that we see of iron, manganese, and cobalt, and then again eliminate dissolved metals. So this figure was to demonstrate when the five-year reviews would be due and what we were proposing for when VOCs and metals should be sampled. So if you look at the middle column of this figure, 2022, 27, 32, and 37 would be the, the five-year review signature due dates. On the left would be the years with the arrow indicating when we were proposing to sample the VOCs. 
and on the left the arrows are linked with the year to the five-year view of when we're proposing to do the biennial metal sampling site 36 closed landfill this one is over at the stump neck annex across the river from the main area of indian head and this sampling program includes one monitoring well with four pore water sampling points that are sampled semi-annually and the groundwater cocs at this site are arsenic iron and manganese at this one we've done over 17 rounds of sampling we've seen minimal low level voc detections and then no M mcl exceedances in any of the rounds we have seen consistent exceedances for iron and manganese at the pore water sampling points and other metals such as arsenic cobalt lead and zinc and for this one we've seen that turbidity is a potential problem with the pore water wells as we've seen the uh, total concentrations are higher than dissolved so our proposed optimization for this site is to reduce the voc sampling frequency from semi-annual to biannually reduce the metal sampling frequency from semi-annual to annual and then reduce the constituent list down to 14 metals with the exceedances and you can see that long list i have below and then we're going to continue the total and dissolved analyses for this site so as a summary slide that i include here some of the conclusions we saw that the majority of the vocs have been non-detect limited detections below the screening criteria we've also seen the metals concentrations are stable and we've not seen increasing or decreasing trends We've also seen that numerous metals have been consistently below screening criteria and total and dissolved metals concentrations are consistently correlated. Another important uh, summary point to note here was regulator concurrence. Once we got into monitoring these landfill sites, uh, Maryland Department of Environment agreed up front that we would need to do a minimum of five years of sampling before they would consider any reductions in the long-term monitoring program so i can think of an example where uh, a five-year review might be due and we only had two or three years of monitoring data on one of the landfills and the answer to reducing anything was we'll continue to monitor for two or three more years to get a minimum of five and then capture that in the next five-year review then another point to note was based on the trend analysis of no increasing or decreasing trends the regulators were agreeable to the reductions of the long-term monitoring frequency and the analyte lists. So some of the goals we achieved with these three sites, we had team acceptance on the resolution of the recommendations for all three. We determined the path forward for upcoming long-term monitoring events, which ties into budgeting and scheduling. And then Another very important achievement here was the cost avoidances. For site 11 and 21, we're seeing about $42,000 saved annually. And for third, site 36, it's $24,000. All of this information was written in an optimization tech memo, which was finalized about a year ago. And then some lessons learned I include are that actively engaging the regulators with your optimization plans early in the long-term monitoring plan is important to pay off later in other words when we we're before we even sampled any of these sites for the first round we had an agreement with md that while we're going to sample for five years for analytes tape record tables one and two and then we'll see where the data is and then evaluate that to possibly have reductions and then i also mentioned as a last point that batching similar sites together really helps in managing a long-term monitoring program so what's important with that is trying to have one contractor monitor all the sites and keep them on the same frequency wherever possible and that helps with things such as base access reporting um, and provides streamlining and costing and jocelyn i will turn this over to you now all right thanks joe me Okay, I am going to be talking about a treatability study optimization that was performed by Exwick for the Onizuka Village site at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. So for those of you who are um, not familiar with, you know, the circle of phases, the treatability study is 
um, something that was done under the phase two remedial investigation phase. So here we see the location of Onizuka Village, which is located on the island of Oahu. The photo on the right shows the site location on Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, and the area in red is Onizuka Village. The green rectangles are two runways that used to be there in the 1940s. The photo on the bottom shows an overlay of the Onizuka Village homes where they sit today on top of an old aerial photograph showing the parked aircraft from the 1940s. And just to give you a broad overview of the site, Onizuka Village covers 80 acres and is privatized housing. Commercial and industrial facilities are to the west, south, and east. Preferential pathways for vapor intrusion exist in the form of storm drains and other utilities. There's pesticide impacted soil, which is burrito wrapped and buried beneath and around the homes. Groundwater is between 9 and 11 feet below ground surface and is not a potable water source. Fuel pipelines carried aviation gasoline from a pipeline across the street to fuel hydrants. So in 2011, near slab and sub slab soil gas sampling and indoor air sampling were conducted. High concentrations of TPH gas, benzene and methane were detected adjacent to the homes between four to six feet below ground surface. And the thought was that vapors could potentially reach inside the homes. So a treatability study was programmed to evaluate if subslab depressurization or soil vapor extraction would be effective at lowering the soil vapor concentrations. OK. Um, so we had two remedial action objectives. One was to reduce concentrations and protect residents from potential vapor intrusion into homes. And the second was to prevent migration. A remediation goal was set at 600,000 micrograms per cubic meter for TPHS gasoline. The treatability study involved setting up a soil vapor extraction system beneath the homes. This figure shows locations of the fuel hydrants in red that come across the street to the Onizuka village. Soil vapor extraction piping in the form of three distinct legs were drilled horizontally and installed. These went to seven areas or hotspots, um, as indicated by these triangles. Uh, these hotspots had the highest TPH gas in soil vapor. The red circles show the baseline and final concentrations. So the baseline for SVE1, which is this leg here, the baseline was uh, 39 million micrograms per cubic meter of TPH gas in 2013. And you can see by the end of the treatability study in 2019, the TPH gas concentrations had been reduced to 4,700 micrograms per cubic meter, which was the, um, it was pretty much non-detect. And similar for, um, so this is another hotspot here and that went from uh, 5,600,000 micrograms per cubic meter to um, 709,000 micrograms or 4,800 4, micrograms per cubic meter by the end of the study. And likewise uh, for SVE3, it reduced from 24 million micrograms per cubic meter to 24,000 micrograms per cubic meter. Okay. 
These are the results from May of 2019. So looking at the sample point ASG3-02, you can see that in just under two years, the TPH gas concentration um, dropped from 30,900,000 micrograms per cubic meter in 2017 to non-detect in 2019. This figure shows extraction rates, and I give credit to Travis Lewis at NAFAC Exwick, who put together the trends and did this optimization evaluation. So what this figure shows is um, starting in 2014, when the system had started, um, we, immediate see, we immediately see a decrease in the TPH gas concentrations. And um, by May of 2016, we had reached a plateau to the point where we felt that it wasn't necessary to continue to remove soil gas, but we continued anyway to show the Department of Health that the system continues to be effective and um, that it wouldn't rebound after it was shut down. This is a summary of mass that was removed just for 2015 and 2016, and it shows approximately 1,462 kilograms of TPH gas removed by the SVE system, and approximately 2,170 kilograms of TPH gas removed via biodegradation. So that was, you know, measured by um, methane and carbon dioxide and oxygen. Okay. So looking at vacuum measurements from SVE1, which is the um, northernmost of the three horizontal legs, what you see is a vacuum range of point negative 0.25 to negative 1.75. And the closer you are to zero means that the vacuum pressure is creating an insignificant amount of vacuum in the system. And that could be due to pressure loss somewhere along the length of the pipe. This figure, Uh, nope. This figure here is um, showing the oxygen delivery to um, this sh shows the oxygen delivery to the SVE one system or. Uh, I guess. Wait, let me. Nope, I already discussed this. Sorry. Sorry, I meant to be this one. This figure shows the cross section of the SVE1 system. So you can see that it does this weird little jog over a utility corridor at the center of the cross section. This pretty much reduced the effectiveness of the vacuum at the far end of the piping, which translated into higher TPH gas concentrations beyond where the piping crossed over this utility corridor. And here, is where we show the oxygen delivery uh, concentration or the percentage of oxygen delivered through the SVE1 system. So oxygen delivery was pretty good at most locations, but at um, this green line here, there was less than 2% oxygen delivery into that far end 
uh, beyond where the piping corridor was. And that indicated anaerobic conditions um, in this area here, possibly due to you know, the low permeability soils as well as high moisture content in the soil. So now moving on to the second leg of the system, which is this SVE2. And basically we saw significant reduction of TPH gas concentrations to where they were below the Department of Health environmental action levels for TPH. So there were no issues um, with this leg of the system. And so moving on to um, this third leg, which is SVE3, there was still a high concentration of TPH gas at one hot spot of 3,490,000 micrograms per cubic meter. And we think this was due to elevated moisture or blockage of the slotted piping since 115 gallons of water was removed from this particular section in one month. Water entrainment from irrigation would significantly reduce the vacuum strength, which is what we saw here and what you'll see in the upcoming slides. Um, <clears throat> so, um, again, this is just showing the um, high exceedance of TPH gas at one location here uh, along the third leg. And um, even at the end of the treatability study, we still had the 3,490,000 micrograms per cubic meter. So we know that there was a problem uh, still existing at this location. And this is showing a cross section of SVE3, which consists of a small portion of weathered tuff, which is um, a highly consolidated material like, um, like clay. And it, the piping eventually goes through highly permeable sand and gravel um, along the rest of the pipeline. So there was a, you know, if there wasn't a, a loss, lots of water at the hotspot location, the TPH gas concentration would have been greatly reduced because of the type of geology that was located here. This figure just shows the vacuum measurement near the hotspot, which is uh, indicated by this gray line. And it also shows that the vacuum pressure was closer to zero, which was likely the result of water getting into the, the piping system. And here we see low oxygen delivery as shown by this orange line. Again, to, um, you know, oxygen wasn't reaching the the hot spot area possibly due to the um, water getting into the system so despite the remaining two hot spots at the far end of the sve1 um, due to uh, being at the end of the utility corridor and at SVE3 due to water in the piping, um, the SVE system did show that TPH gas reached asymptotic levels starting in 2016. Measurements of methane and carbon dioxide also showed that biodegradation was effective using the SVE system. And we did meet the RAOs to reduce concentrations and protect residents from potential intrusions 
vapor intrusion into the homes and to prevent migration. So some challenges that we had with running the system were that, you know, we wanted to use solar power, but um, realized pretty quickly within a matter of weeks that uh, we required backup battery system. And the initial batteries that were installed were lithium, but they were not the right type and required changing out uh, twice to lead acid batteries, which was, you know, quite expensive each time uh, at 70,000. There was also poor TPH reduction after the utility corridor in SVE1 and at um, SVE3, possibly due to water from residents, um, water in the, the ground from residents who are watering their grass. So the low, low permeability subsurface conditions at these two locations due to clay and volcanic tuff was also um, likely the reason for why we didn't see a lot of TPH reduction at those hot spots. So the contract at the time recommended continuing to operate the system um, and also proposed using in situ chemical oxidation at the locations that had uh, elevated TPH concentrations. Um, if not using ISCO, they recommended adding a vacuum at the far end of the SVE1 system to address um, that part that wasn't really getting a lot of oxygen into the system. And then the last thing they recommended was doing a rebound study. So because of the um, where what data we were seeing uh, with the plateauing of um, the asymptotic levels in 2016, as well as these contractor recommendations, the RPM asked for a second opinion and sent all of the monitoring results to Exwick, who did an optimization review. The recommendations that Exwick came up with were to shut down the SVE system and to look at rebound after two years. So monitoring occurred through 2019 and 2020. And as a guide, Exwick developed statements about what to do if rebound was encountered. This is the cost analysis that was developed by Exwick. Basically, if we followed the contractor recommendations, we would spend approximately $560,000 annually to operate and maintain the system, which includes um, doing additional battery replacement, and then $1.8 million for an in-situ chemical oxidation study. Um, what Exwick recommended was instead to do uh, vertical vapor intrusion profiling and an m and evaluation using carbon traps, as well as uh, shutting down the system to do the rebound study. And all of this would have cost $150,000. So the cost avoidance um, resulting from this optimization review was approximately $480,000 for the continuation of the SVE system um, and savings of $1.7 million for the ISCO. The SVE system was shut down in 2017 to assess rebound, and in 2020, soil vapor samples showed that TPH gas concentrations were still below the remediation goal of 600,000 micrograms per cubic meter. And all of the other COPC concentrations were likewise below Department of Health action levels, um, indicating that there was no rebound at any of the locations. So the system was permanently shut down in 2020. 
In conclusion, the regulators agreed last November that soil vapor sampling was no longer needed and this SVE system could be demobilized and moved to another project. So that concludes my talk on Onizuka Village and I'll now turn the controls over to Christine. Let me. Thank you, Jocelyn. I think I have control and I'm going way too fast. I apologize. OK, all right. I would like to talk to you today about the optimization efforts that have been conducted to date at Naval Air Weapons Station China Lake Armitage Field Operable Unit. Um, China Lake, just a little bit of background. China Lake is located um, between the Sierra Nevadas and Death Valley, about four hours away from San Diego, and if you're not for Cal from California, it's about 230 miles. It surrounds the ridge, the city of Ridgecrest, and it's divided into two different areas, the main complex and the Randsburg Wash Mojave B complex. Um, the sites are grouped together into the Armitage Field Operable Unit based on the waste disposed at the site. Uh, they dispose of off-spec fuels, wash water uh, containing degreasers and detergents, and it was disposed of mostly to ground service, and at Site 1, they had um, dry wells they disposed of. Additionally, they have um, eight sites total. One's a point of interest. There's also a gas station that's in there also somewhere uh, west of 45. Remediation has been ongoing. Or sorry, um, let's back up just a second. In 1982, they stopped operations, uh, disposal operations. In 1983, they started looking into cleanup. 1986, they got a cleanup and abatement order from the water board. 1988, they installed a pilot system and started remediation at the site. And in 2007, they developed the, re the record of decision and they determined that it would be MA, monitored natural attenuation, and land use controls for groundwater. They had low level concentrations of um, VOCs, specifically chlorinated solvents, associated with the disposal practices. And then free product mitigation for sites 1 and 44. On the left, the bottom left colorful photo is the sites, uh, site one at the time, the plume, pre-product plume at the time of the record of decision. And on the right of that, you'll see the entire operable unit and you can kind of see the dashed blue or red lines, the dashed lines around some of the sites and those are the plumes. The green lines are the um, chlorinated solvent groundwater plumes and the blue and the Red are the free product plumes. Free product mitigation at site one through pilot testing, they determined vacuum enhanced skimming and product recovery would be completed at site one. And then the rod just determined that it would be continued at site one and expanded to address more of the plume. Site 44, they decided on mobile recovery because they didn't have the same geology over there. There's tidal soils and the SVE wasn't going to work. So they have soil or mobile pro product recovery and um, these things called soil sippers. They're uh, so uh, solar sippers. They're uh, solar skimmy skimmers on some of the wells out there. And so in 2016, the five year re review remit recommended optimization of the free product and SVE system at site one and also to look at 44.
I do want to point out that um, the rod free product mitigation was a uh, removal of free product to the ma maximum extent practical practicable for one and 44. It's just a quick note because that's kind of free product to the maximum extent practicable isn't always measurable. So for site one, the SVE and product recovery systems at the 2016 conditions at the five year review, um, they were continued decline, declining review recovery for the VES and the mobile recovery. All product recovery wells were yielding less than five gallons per day. Average product removal rate for the overall system extraction system was less than a pound per day. And I also just wanted to note that the current system was installed as a pilot system from 1988. And on the right, you'll see that this is just a little schematic of the SVE system. And on the lower right, that's the mobile recovery, pro mobile product they built. So just move around from well to well for product during events. And it was usually biannually. Oh, and one quick thing to point out for these, those criteria were actually the criteria set forth in the rod. OK, the 2017 remediation system evaluation work plan, the purpose of it was to perform a review of the data and the cleanup processes to make sure that we're doing it effectively, protective, protective of the environment and cost efficiently and we want to move towards remedy completion. This has been cleaning up since 1988, so a long time. So they wanted to determine the current understanding of the plume, identify if there was any natural source zone depletion, reevaluate the remedial action objectives, the goals and the closure status or strategy strategies assess the protectedness of the current remedy and identify opportunities for optimization and cost savings. So they completed the field work. Um, they reviewed the remediation system data and you will see that on the right hand side, um, product is in the lower lighter color and vapor, soil vapor is in the upper darker color. And you can you can't really see the date, but it's 2017. So by this time we're seeing asymptotical returns on product for a long, long time. And vapor, we're just really kind of starting to see it kind of go flat. So it's definitely a good time. It was a good time to look at this. So the shutdown criteria, free product, like I mentioned before, free product yield of five gallons or less per day per well, asymptotic trends, which we are seeing, um, and if either of these two conditions occur at an individual well, we will continue or discontinue the system. So we, this is the the review said, OK, yeah, it looks like we can probably discontinue the system. And then completed the free product transmissivity testing. And so this is the um, ITRC guidance and ASTM guidance. And um, ITRC specifically has an LNAPL free product transmissivity range between 0.1 and 0.08 feet square per day that may be used as a decision point for remediation system operation and to transition into a different technology. So they also did transmissivity testing to see what kind of ranges we were getting. And they completed, I have spelling error, completed laser induced fluorescence and cone spectrometer testing to verify that their understanding of the soil was um, correct. Specifically, they have this caliche layer that runs through the site. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, but they verify that that's it and that they're not getting a false response. And then the laser induced fluorescence, they just spot check to see, are we still seeing low concentrations? They had done something like three studies out there previously, so they had plenty of data on previous uh, laser induced fluorescence. And then they also did carbon flux and thermal surface subsurface monitoring to see if there was any um, natural source zone depletion.
They also were supposed to evaluate the life cycle costs of the um, system, but they ran out of time, money, and that's the last I'll say of that. OK. OK, and so their findings, they their CPT, HPT, the results determined the same. They're seeing their same sequences of heterogeneous interbedded sequences of clay, sand, silts. They're still finding the caliche layer and nothing new there. Uh, LIF uvos, they still are not seeing significant contamination outside the main plume and their wavelengths response um, were interpreted interpreted caliche where we saw caliche and corresponded to borings. Um, LNAPL transmissivity testing. Um, I highlighted this in red because we've been, like I said, we've been cleaning this plume up since 1988 roughly. And for a plume that's been cleaned up for a long time, it was kind of, these are kind of high transmissivity values if you look at transmissivity values on a frequent basis. Like I said, the range that we were looking at to, for a decision point was 0.1 to 0.8 and our asymptotic returns were just there. So we were thinking something a little higher, but the second at 44 specifically in the tight soils, they had a transmissivity range of seven to 15 and that just seems suspicious. So in our conclude, well, I'll get there in a minute. So that just note that that seems suspicious. It looks suspicious. We didn't get a second review of the data that was published in our report. Carbon flux uh, did show some natural source zone depletion rates. Um, they were low to moderate. Uh, there was a little bit better um, rates at site 44, but we also only did the thermal subsurface natural zone source zone depletion at site one. Um, and it's kind of showed the same thing. We're get, there's something happening out there. OK, so. The regulatory response on our findings was that the CPT LIF were just a snapshot in time and they wanted us to define the plume by adding monitoring wells. Um, this is kind of against ITRC guidance and kind of this plume is really old and there's no indications of a new plume. There was uh, the dropping groundwater levels. There was no reason for monitoring wells and they gave no reason why except for that it was snapshot in time for CPT LAF and that the only way we're going to monitor was monitoring wells. Uh, boring borings were missing, the contamination. Um, that was another reason for that reason we needed monitoring wells because we didn't place our borings in the right locations to find the contamination. They also disagreed with our interpretation of the caliche layer, although it's historically been um, mapped as the caliche layer and backed up by site data. Uh, transmissivity, again, I mentioned that it was high. It wasn't reviewed by more than one person, but the agencies were showing this as the one line of proof that that the transmissivity was high and that we still needed active remediation regardless of anything else showing no need for maybe active remediation but a transition into something else and um they also had complaints that we didn't include all the wells but on the back side of that one we didn't include all the wells because they didn't let us because we don't have boring logs for all of them. So per the request, we didn't include them. Let's look, catch 22 there. Natural source zone depletion, it, they also said it was a snapshot shot in time. You needed to account for seasonal effects uh, and they were suspicious of the technology because it didn't work at one other location. So it, it was suspicious at this because it didn't work there. And then the SVE evaluation, they didn't agree with the shutdown criteria that was established in the ROD that was previously established in a corrective action plan. Uh, they wanted to see different shutdown criteria such as rebound effects. Um, and it all came down to we couldn't pass this optimization report off to them without 
agreeing to collect additional data. Um, specifically, one of the things that came down to is um, I don't think they really did a good job communicating with the regulatory agencies up front on what they wanted to see. Like they said, they said, well, we want you to reevaluate your optimization or your recovery um, criteria, but they never specified what they wanted and they didn't argue with it until after the data has been collected and the report's been produced. So one of the big conclusions on this was make sure you have buy-in from your regulators. And I know Joseph said this too, but it's really important. China Lake specifically is now in a agency partnering, but again, continue partnering. Make sure you have the buy-in. Just because they see something, make sure you get it spelled out. It's kind of important that they don't say, oh, I just want you to look at that. Well, what do they want you to look at specifically? Um, and then continue to push for resolution. Don't just give up and walk away. You need. We need to get this done. We have metrics. We got to meet it. Work with your agencies and then agree upon an approach. And um, it needs to be a give and take. They can't just take everything and you give everything. You've really got to work with your agencies on the give and take. And then some quality objectives um, involve your SMEs. They didn't have a secondary review of the data and I'll get to that in a second, but it's important that you make sure you have on the con contractor side, you're having the right people review it and on the Navy side, you're having the right people review it. And then sometimes this is more of a Navy thing. It's making sure that as the RPM, you're doing your best to get the right contract and contractor for the job. Some companies and contracts will specify that they do specific types of remediation or specialty things. Most people do it nowadays, but just make sure you're not getting somebody that's never done it before. That's the big takeaway. And then again, clear objectives um, from your agencies and from your contractors and that everybody's on the same page. And I was just going to give you a quick update on our we had to go back for a second optimization study. And so a couple of things that they looked at when they were putting together the work plan is the data from the trans the transmissivity data. And they proposed in the original work plan, they did propose using the ASTM standard for transmissivity testing, and it's a recommendation for a spill buddy, and it's just to help with competent testing. And I'm here to say that you can use you can do testing without a spill buddy and still get a good test, but that's one of the things they recommended and it wasn't used. Um, so the next test will be using it. Um, also, they proposed using the uh, transmissivity workbooks, which they did, but they did a lot of things wrong. They didn't filter the data. They didn't account for drawdown. They didn't account for certain ratios. They didn't do certain analysis, but you can see there's a long list of red things. Um, so the future action is where like use the spill buddy, complete the testing using the technical guidance and then make sure you have a quality data review. And that was it. I just wanted to point out that the current uh, project manager RPM for China Lake is Samantha Knoll and then Tony and I are previous. And that's all I had. I'll turn it back to Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, um, Joe and Jocelyn. We will now move on to our Q&A session. So please submit your questions to the Q&A chat box. Um, we'll start with our first question from Mayo Geophysical Services. This is for Christine. How consistent are the subsurface layers like clay silts, caliche, etc., from site one to site 44? Fairly consistent, except for there's tighter soils at 44, so they have more clays and silts there. Does that answer your question? Yep, it should. Um, and I have another question. This one is for Jocelyn. Um, so, uh, can you explain more about why the solar power didn't work and why were battery replacements needed? Sure, so solar power, even though we 
you know, this is Hawaii <laughs> and we have a lot of sunshine here. Um, effectively, we only had like 12 hours of sunlight a day. And so the system wasn't running at night. And in order to be an effective SVE system, um, you know, the contractor felt that we needed to have the system running 24 hours a day. So we had uh, purchased batteries and they were the wrong kind of batteries. They, um, they, they weren't holding enough of the power that was being generated from the solar panels. And so they would, um, I guess, burn out. So we had to go with a different type of battery. Got it. Thank you. Another question for you, Jocelyn. Um, did you ever install any barrier systems under the Onizuka housing units? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, mm -hmm. which is probably why there was no uh, vapor intrusion coming into the home. So those homes were relatively recently built in the early 2000s and they had uh, vapor barriers put down beneath the concrete before the concrete footings were placed. So yes, there are barrier systems. Thank you. Um, so that concludes our Q&A session. If you have any, if there are any participants that have any more questions, feel free to email them to xwick underscore t2 at navy.mil. And I just wanted to wrap up this webinar. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions and thank you so much to our presenters for your thoughtful answers and for sharing your experiences in optimization. Um, please reach out to Joe, Jocelyn and Christine directly in the email address um, shown previously on the slide. We'll have the recording and the webinar posted on our public website once again. Um, I'm going to send out an email to the participants of this webinar of a survey, and if you can please uh, take it, it will provide us with valuable feedback. So stay tuned for our future OER2s through the T2 email. If you have not subscribed already, um, you can put your email in our Q&A box and we'll have you added onto the list, or you can also email um, us at xwick underscore t2 at navy.mil to be added on. Uh, we post our OER2 presentations to our YouTube page, so make sure you check that out as well. Uh, thank you everyone again for attending this OER2 webinar, and we look forward to having you back next time.